Well, hello again. I'm speaking to you again from my bedroom because, again, for the third week in a row, we are unable to gather as an Orchard Community Church due to the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. The, this sermon is intended for Sunday, March 29th. Uh, maybe you're listening to it some other time, and that's okay. But I'm guessing no matter where you are and what you're going through, you could probably use a bit of encouragement right now. And today we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, the very end of this letter. And Peter tells us at the very end of the letter his whole point for writing this letter in the first place. He says, I've written to you briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. He tells these people going through a tough time that he wants to encourage them. And in this closing, he's going to do three things. He's going to remind them that they're not alone, but they share a relationship. They have fellowship with other believers, some whom they they don't see right now. They're scattered, maybe isolated, but they have a relationship with these other believers. He tells them then to stand fast in true grace. And then he concludes with a statement about the peace we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we dig into this text. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone listening to this or watching this right now, whenever it may be. Maybe it's right now uh, during March 2020 when I'm preaching this, or maybe it's sometime in the future. But God, you know their situation in their hearts and the encouragement that they need. And you know that it is your grace that is the greatest encouragement to all of us. And so I pray today, may we focus on that true grace of yours through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let me read the passage for us. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, as we look at this today, he starts with this idea of fellowship. He's going to remind them of a few key people. And as he does this, we need to understand the context and what this meant to them to be reminded of fellowship. Remember, they were facing persecution, struggling. Persecution specifically because of their faith. Early persecution, we've talked about this, the the really bad persecution that would break out in the Roman Empire against uh, all Christians would come soon. They're just beginning to see the beginnings of that, the first inklings of what would develop into something much worse. Friends and family are turning against them. They're losing social connections. They're losing economic connections. They're facing hardships in their society. And all of this can make someone feel very alone, very isolated, very socially distant from those around them. And I think we can identify with that right now as we are literally having to distance ourselves from one another because of the virus that is spreading in our world today. But I'm concerned about that. And there's something Peter doesn't really talk about specifically in this passage, but I think what he writes applies to this. And that's loneliness. Loneliness puts us in a dangerous place. It's what I would call a red flag situation. When I counsel people or sometimes meet with people that are struggling with a particular sin or some issue in their life that they need help with, we talk a lot about these red flag situations. We talk about a pattern that leads to that particular sin or puts them in a mindset where they, they're tempted and they want to give in to that sin, or maybe puts them in a physical place where they're more likely to give in to that sin. It might be an activity. It might be interactions with a certain person or not interacting with a certain person. It might be specific emotions or times of day or whatever it is. Situations they are in where they are more prone to being tempted and to giving in to that temptation. Now, a red flag situation is not wrong. It's not a bad situation in and of itself, but it's a place where we know we are weak and prone to temptation. And I truly believe that loneliness is a red flag situation for 
all of us. We get in this place where we feel like nobody understands, like nobody cares what we're going through, that nobody understands what we're going through or the suffering, or maybe we start feeling like I'm the only one that's really suffering with this. And maybe right now you go on social media and you see people having all these wonderful times during this social distancing quarantine that we're going through. And maybe you're thinking, but I'm suffering, I'm struggling. And you're feeling that loneliness right now. You know, when we're lonely, our thoughts become like an echo chamber. It's like a glass bowl of loneliness is put over our, our thoughts and these thoughts bounce out of our heads, hit the glass wall of loneliness and bounce back even louder and it goes on and on. We might feel like we are unloved and that thought goes out. And then in our loneliness, it echoes back to us, you are unloved. And we accept this echoing truth that we are unloved. And then we start using that to interpret everything around us. And our own thoughts go out and echo back, are accepted, go out, echo back, and they keep getting louder and louder and louder until we don't hear anything else except our echoing thoughts. Why? Because we're lonely. Because we, we are stuck and we feel alone, whether we are actually alone or we just feel that way. And when we get lonely in this red flag, dangerous situation, we stop listening to truth coming from outside that glass bowl. We stop listening to truth from God. We stop listening to truth from others that are pointing us to God and to his word. Now, maybe we actually are in a situation where we can't get together with other people. But that doesn't mean we have to give in to the red flag, dangerous situation of being lonely. Reach out to family members. Reach out to one another. Pour over God's word. Spend time in his word, digging into it. Remind yourself and encourage yourself of the grace of God. And remind yourself, even though you're not in those relationships, remind yourself of the wonderful relationships that God has put in place in your life. When we're lonely or we're going through a time of isolation like we are right now, we need to see that red flag waving. We need to admit that we are prone to giving in right now to temptation and sin, that our thoughts might be warped and misleading. We need to shake ourselves out of that red flag situation and reach out to one another for help. And the letter of First Peter is written to suffering people that are, as First Peter 1 once says, scattered. They might literally be isolated or simply be feeling isolated from one another. And in chapter 5, verse 9, just a little bit ago, we looked at uh, this quote, the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Peter reminds them they're not the only ones struggling. And now here at the end of this letter, he gives them greetings by mentioning specific people or groups of people that are in the family of believers with them, going through sufferings as well, to remind them again, you have fellowship with one another. You are not alone. And he mentions first Silas. Some translations might have Silvanus, which is kind of a Romanized or Latinized version of the, the name Silas. This is probably the same Silas that traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey. He's a cousin of Barnabas. Peter says that Silas helped him to write this letter. Now, that can really mean two things. It could mean that Silas was kind of like a secretary, that Peter would dictate the contents of the letter and Silas would write it down as like his scribe. So it could mean that. It could also mean that Silas delivered the letter to Peter. He helped him in that way by delivering it. Could also mean both. Silas wrote it down and delivered it. We don't really know exactly, specifically, how Silas helped, but Peter calls him a faithful brother. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother. Silas has helped Peter. Peter knows, because of Silas and many others, he knows he's not alone. Peter has gone through a lot of sufferings and trial in his life and in his ministry to Jesus Christ as well. But God has brought many people into Peter's life to help him, to come alongside as that faithful brother or sister in Christ and to help him out. And he's pointing that out now to the people that he's writing to, I think partially to say, you guys aren't alone either. 
And then he says in verse 13, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. Now, this is interesting. Scholars debate a lot who this is, who is this she who is in Babylon, where is Babylon, what is that really? Without going into too much detail, basically it's possible that Peter is talking about one particular woman who lives in some place he's calling Babylon. But the phrase chosen together with you and the way he uses this phrase leads me to believe he's talking about a church, a gathering of believers. And by calling it who lives in Babylon, he's speaking of the city of Rome. This was a common way in the early first century to speak of Rome. Throughout scriptures, well, in the Old Testament mostly, in the Old Testament, God's people went into exile in Babylon. He's writing a letter here to people in exile as believers in their day. In Revelation, John will use this image of Babylon again to speak about Rome or kind of the world set against Christ in general. But here I think Peter is using it to speak about a church, probably a church that lives in and gathers in Rome. Rome is the heart, of course, of the Roman Empire of that day. And Peter was either writing from Rome, some people take this verse to mean that, or it's very possible he's just receiving letters from Rome, receiving visitors from Rome, maybe Silas came from there or Mark, and then he's sending those on to them. But no matter what, he's telling them this church, this gathering of people in Rome, which was probably experiencing the worst persecution yet of all the believers. And he's saying, those people that are struggling too, they're thinking of you right now. They're praying for you right now. They're sending you their greetings. They are in that struggle with you. They are not alone. They, like you, are chosen by God. They, like you, are going through struggles and they are thinking of you sharing fellowship with you. Now, Peter mentions one more person. He talks about Mark here. He says, and so does my son, Mark. More than likely, this is the Mark, sometimes called John Mark, who traveled with Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey, also the one that wrote the gospel of Mark. It's doubtful that that Mark, or, or even the Mark, if it's someone different here, it's doubtful that Mark was literally a biological son of Peter. He's probably speaking of Mark as one whom maybe he brought to Jesus Christ in the first place, or someone that he has mentored. We know that John Mark spent a lot of time with Peter. In fact, uh, church history records that that's where Mark got most of the material for his first gospel, by spending a lot of time with Peter. Now, Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter again reminds these Christians that this guy, Mark, sends his greetings as well. Maybe they knew Mark from his travels with Paul or his interactions with Peter or just traveling around. But either way, Peter is saying, he sends you his greetings. You are not alone. And then if we jump down to the end, verse 14, right at the beginning, he tells them to greet one another with a kiss of love. This was a normal greeting in their time. Uh, maybe for a close friend or family member. It was probably a, a kiss on the cheek. Um, could be similar to a handshake or a hug today. The point is that Peter is telling them to greet other Christians in this way. That which would have been for a close friend in their society or for a family member, now he's saying that relationship, that closeness, applies to one another in Jesus Christ. That's powerful. He's reminding them to show that bond, that link of fellowship with one another, to show it to one another, to be active in showing it to one another. Like many other letters in the New Testament, Peter concludes his letter with several personal greetings. And he's telling these people, and I think reminding us today, that there are people whose ministry and whose testimony we know we know the impact they've had on our lives. We know they are thinking about us and praying for us. There are people right now, wherever you are, there are people thinking of you and praying for you in the loneliness of whatever it is you're going through. We need this encouragement today. We need to know that we are a part of something so much bigger than the little glass fishbowl of loneliness that we might be feeling right now in our isolation 
So this is one encouragement, this fellowship that they share with one another. Let's look at another encouragement, which is really the heart of this passage and a summary of the total uh, letter that Peter writes to them. And we see it at the end of verse 12. He says, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. He gives them the encouragement of grace. This is his whole reason for writing this letter, to encourage them and to testify to God's grace. I want to give us a quick overview of grace in 1 Peter because it is powerful. If you turn to chapter 1, verse 10, he talks about the grace of their salvation. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care. And then he goes on. But he mentions their salvation and the grace that came to them through their salvation. Well, what's he talking about? Let me read verses 3 through 9 because that's what he's referring to. Praise be to God and Father, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This grace that was to come to them, that prophets of old earnestly looked into, wanted to know what it would be. He says, this is the salvation they have in Jesus Christ. The salvation we have today through Jesus Christ, the new birth into a living hope, the inheritance of heaven, the shield that we have in faith during this difficult time, whenever this difficult time might be. And all of this is for God's glory. So Peter reminds his readers in this letter of the grace they have in Jesus Christ, the salvation they have in Christ, this past grace that is theirs because of Jesus Christ that has come to them through acceptance, through faith. So Peter talks about what they have through Christ, but he has another way of speaking about God's grace as well. Look at verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, here he's talking about a future grace. The grace brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. What they're going through right now, the suffering and the persecution, being scattered, all of this, he says, is nothing compared to the grace that is going to come to them when they are living forever in the very presence of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's not all. He talks not only about the past grace of Christ and the future grace of Christ, but then he applies it to their lives right now and he challenges us and encourages us to live lives right now shaped by this grace of Jesus Christ. Look at verses 14 through 16. So he says, set your minds that are, uh, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace that is coming to you. And then verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And that's really the main body of Peter's letter is this challenge and this encouragement. You have been changed by Jesus Christ. You have a future in Jesus Christ. That grace that bookends both ends of our life, that grace that is who we are, our identity in Jesus Christ, changes our lives now. We are to live differently because of grace. And he adds an interesting idea in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. If you turn there with me, he says, 
Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So we right now not only have received grace, but we are stewards. We are servants giving out that grace of God to others. We've become conduits of God's grace to other people. So we can look back on the grace that is ours through Jesus Christ, through his cross, his death on the cross and his burial and the resurrection. We can look forward to the grace of Jesus Christ that is ours when he returns, being in his presence forever and ever. We are living right now in the grace of Jesus Christ that God has given us, changing us from the inside out, making us holy, making us live different. And we are stewards of that grace in all that we do. This is a big picture of grace. And that's what Peter says at the end of this book when he says, this is the grace that I am encouraging you with. I am testifying to. This is the true grace of God. And I want to pause for a second on that one word, true. This implies that there is and there was during Peter's day a false grace of God. A teaching that looked like grace, but wasn't actually grace. And that has always been true throughout the history of the church. Second Peter actually speaks more about this. It talks about, in Second Peter chapter 2, it talks about false teachers teaching false things, heresies. In fact, they were teaching to new Christians that they should or it was okay to give in to their sinful desires, to be led away by them, rather than being changed by Jesus Christ. They promised freedom in Christ, but then led believers right back to being enslaved by their own sin. There are, I think, two primary ways that we still struggle with this in church today. Two ways that I think we teach a false grace. There's probably others, but these are two I want to highlight. One is that we teach we are saved by Jesus Christ, but then we must fix ourselves. We must make ourselves holy. We must make ourselves clean enough for God, good enough for God, so that he will accept us. This is a salvation that is not based on grace. It's based on works. It's based on our effort, our own control. If we just do this, whatever this is, then we'll be good enough for God. That is a false grace. The second teaching of false grace that I think has become even more popular today is a teaching that God wants to give you what you want. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants to give you whatever you want, whatever your heart desires. This too is a false grace because true grace, scripture says, saves us from our own desires that enslave us to sin. If we are then taught, oh, now you're saved, just get whatever you want, we are going right back into the slavery that Jesus Christ died to save us out of. It leaves us trapped in our own sin. That, too, is a false grace. First Peter is written to testify and encourage his readers in the true grace of God. Second Peter is written specifically as a warning against that false grace. And Peter says back in 1 Peter 5.12 that we are to stand fast in the true grace of God. We will not overcome the difficulties of this world or the difficulties of our own lives by changing and distorting and twisting God's grace. No matter how much better it makes us feel, we will only stand fast and firm if we stand on true grace. Grace is defined by God's word not by us. Even now, in this worldwide pandemic of the coronavirus, please hear Christians stand firm in the true grace of God through Jesus Christ. So Peter ends this letter by pointing to his whole point throughout the letter to testify and encourage us with the true grace of God in Christ. But now he ends with a powerful ending about the peace that is ours in Christ. Look at verse 14. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, notice what he says. Peace to those who are 
in Christ. The peace that he has to offer, the peace that comes through the true grace of God, is only for those who are in Christ. People will say, Pastor Dave, you're, you're being judgmental. You, you Christians, you're being judgmental and mean. You're being exclusive. You're keeping people out. But Christ is the, life, the lifeboat from the sinking ship of this world. The people on the drowning ship or flailing in the water, or, or I'm sorry, the people on the sinking ship or the ones that are flailing in the water, they can't have peace. They shouldn't have peace. What they should have is an urgency to get to the lifeboat. Only in the lifeboat of faith in Jesus Christ, being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, can there be true peace of being rescued, being saved, being held firm in the grip of God's grace. But don't miss that there is true peace for all who are in Christ. It is the peace of knowing the past grace of God that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place, to take our sin and give us his righteousness. It is the peace that is ours through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the peace of the future grace that is awaiting us when Christ returns, that we will be with him perfect forever in his very presence, forever and ever. It is the peace of present grace that is working in our hearts, changing us, shaping us for his glory, working through us as a conduit of grace to those around us. The world has many troubles, whether it be the persecution of the people in Peter's day, whether it be being caught in sin or being hurt by others or a virus that is spreading around the world or any other trouble that you or someone you love might be facing. But we need to be encouraged, but also challenged that there is true peace in Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have peace. Friends, right now, cling to the true grace of God that is yours in Christ, through Jesus Christ, through the gospel of grace, the salvation that is ours in Christ. Know that you are not alone. Whether you can gather with other believers or not, you have fellowship with believers throughout the history of the church, throughout the entire world, all those who are saved by Jesus Christ. Take some time and you think about them. You think about others and pray for them. Reach out to them and encourage one another. You might not be able to give a hug or a handshake right now because we don't want to infect anybody, but you can make a phone call. You can send a card, you can send an email or a text message, greet one another. Somehow, some way, let us remind one another of the fellowship we have together in the grace of Jesus Christ. And spend time in scripture reminding yourselves of the true grace you have through Jesus Christ. Pour over the true grace of God in Jesus Christ so that we don't get caught up in the lies that we hear from the world or from our own thoughts in the loneliness of this time. May we be encouraged through the true grace of God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we need to know your true grace. God, it's hard right now in this time. Doubts come creeping in. Our world is changing in drastic ways right now. And Father, we know you are sovereign. We, are, we know you are still on your throne. We know that you are the God who has given us past grace through Jesus Christ, future grace in, in Jesus Christ, and are at work right now with present grace of the gospel at work in your people, even as we are separated. And Father, may we be challenged and encouraged to spend time in your word to grow deeper in this true grace that is ours through Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, for those right now that are lonely in this time of being isolated from one another or maybe whenever it is in their lives of just feeling that loneliness and separation. May they run to the true grace they have through Jesus Christ. May they remind themselves of the fellowship they have with other believers. And may they rejoice in the peace that is theirs through Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's anyone listening or watching this online right now that doesn't know that peace, 
that's never accepted the gospel of your grace through your son, Jesus Christ. May they open up your word and read through the gospel of John or read through all of 1 Peter and understand the grace that is theirs through Jesus Christ, your son, who died in their place and rose from the grave, promising eternal life through his death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you, Father, for true grace through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you have a good week. I hope you're hanging in there. Next week, we're going to close off this sermon series on 1 Peter that we've called Scattered. Little did I know when I started this sermon series, we would literally be scattered through this time. But we're going to go back over the whole book and all of the important themes and apply it again to our time right now. I am praying for you, church, during this time. People of Orchard, pray for one another, with one another, reach out to one another, that we might encourage one another with the true grace of Jesus Christ. May God bless you.